In this video, we're going to talk about fissure projections. Fissure projections are another way to depict stereochemistry, but without using hashed and wedged lines. You can see a fissure projection shown here on the left. You can see that we're only using lines, but in the fissure projection, the horizontal lines are supposed to be sticking out at you, and the vertical lines are supposed to be sticking back. So you want to imagine them as in this picture here. Think of the horizontal lines as being wedged and the vertical lines as being hashed. A good way to remember that the horizontal lines are sticking out at you is to think of them as a bow tie. You can see the model here on the right. In this case, C is blue and X is yellow, and these are sticking out at us. W is orange and Y is red, and those groups are going back. Fisher projections can be used for molecules with multiple carbons. An example is shown down here. And again, the horizontal lines are sticking out at us and the vertical lines are sticking back. It's probably helpful in the fissure projection to just add in those hashed and wedged lines as shown here on the bottom right. If you have a standard zigzag conformation shown here, you need to be able to convert this into a fissure projection. In a fissure projection, if you are looking at the molecule from the top, the groups attached to carbon two and carbon four are sticking out at you. And so that's what you're seeing here in this picture on the right. The groups attached to three are only going to stick out at you if you're looking at the molecule from the bottom. And so that's what you have to do in this picture on the right here. You almost have to imagine yourself looking at the molecule from the top, then the bottom, and then the top. This here is what it, the molecule would look like from the top with the groups on two and the groups on four sticking out at us. And this is what the molecule would look like if we were looking at it from the bottom with the groups on three sticking out at us. To help us better understand this, let's take a look at a model. Here's the model of the molecule that we were just looking at. Here's the carboxylic acid here. And this first carbon has the OH group sticking out at us. The second carbon has the OH group sticking out at us. And the third carbon has an OH going back. And this is the CH2OH shown here. So let's rotate the molecule so we can see the Fischer projection. So in this case, you can see the groups here and here sticking out at us. And we have to rotate so it's vertical. And now this is, this is carbon two, and you can see that the OH on carbon two is on the left. And if we go down carbon four, we can see that the OH is on the right. Now we have to rotate the molecule around to see the orientation at carbon three. And here you can see that the OH is on the right. Sugars are designated as either D or L sugars. The DL designation is based off of glyceraldehyde. D-glyceraldehyde is shown here with the OH sticking back, and L-glyceraldehyde is shown here with the OH sticking out at us. That means that a D-sugar has the same orientation of the OH group as D-glyceraldehyde, and an L-sugar has the same orientation of that OH group as L-glyceraldehyde. In the Fischer projection, that means that when the aldehyde is on the top and the CH2OH is on the bottom, the OH is on the right. And for the L sugar, if we draw this in the same orientation, that would put the OH on the left. Here are several examples of carbohydrates. As you can see, if we look at the second to last carbon here, the OH group is on the right, giving us a D sugar. This is true for all of these sugars drawn here because they are based off the orientation of D glyceraldehyde. Notice that all of these sugars have a carbonyl group at the top. Here in the aldose, we have the aldehyde at the top, and here in a ketose, we have the ketone at the top. And as long as we keep that orientation, where the carbonyl group is at the top and the CH2OH is at the bottom, we can just look at that second to last sugar there on the bottom and use that to decide if it's a D or L sugar. The relationship between D and L sugars of the same name are enantiomers. So D glucose here is the enantiomer of L glucose here on the right. You can see that every single stereocenter is flipped. Of course, in D glucose, that bottom OH group is on the right, and in L glucose, that bottom OH group is on the left. So given the structure of D glucose, you should be able to draw the structure of L glucose. Remember that plus glucose and minus glucose are enantiomers. 
So given plus glucose, you should be able to draw a structure of minus glucose and vice versa. It's also important to remember that the D sugars with the OH group on the right are the ones that occur most commonly in nature. Keep in mind that the D and L designations do not correspond to optical rotation. So for example, this sugar is a D sugar because the OH group is on the right, and so is this sugar here, but this one rotates in the minus direction, and this one rotates in the plus direction. So a D sugar can rotate in either in the positive or the negative direction, and an L sugar can also rotate in the positive or the negative direction. Being D or L does not have anything to do with whether it rotates in the positive or minus direction. One important term to know is the term epimer. Epimers are diastereomers, and very specifically, they are diastereomers that differ at only one stereocenter. For example, we have pairs of epimers down here. You can see on the left here, we have C4 epimers. Numbering from the top of the molecule, you can see that they differ at carbon 4. On the right, we have a pair of C2 epimers. Numbering from the aldehyde, you can see that we have a difference at C2. These are diastereomers because we have not flipped all the stereocenters, and specifically they are epimers because we've only flipped one. This concludes Chapter 5. In Interchapter C, we're going to learn how to name molecules with stereocenters.